you please be seated. This is Todd. When Alex gets old enough to, uh, let's say, go to the movie theater, he wants to go to the movie theater. How would you feel about him going to see a movie like Ghostbusters? I don't know. I've never seen the movie. I don't really know what the story is about. It, it deals with um, ghosts, and um, that's why it's called Ghostbusters. That's I right. Saw. Yeah. You know what a ghost is, right? Yes, I do. Don't feel bad. I haven't seen it either, but okay, right. uh, <laughs> good. Ghosts and um, supernatural beings, um, things like that. Uh, it's a comedy, but uh, it, it deals with ghosts and supernatural beings, things of that nature. How would you feel about him going to see a movie like that? Objection, relevance. What is the relevance of that? If she's going to encourage him, discourage him, forbid him from going to see movies that are just regular, fun movies, comedies. I mean. I mean, here's a problem. I mean, I'm not a parent, but it's either I mean, parents and children disagree on on movies and dances and, and, and all sorts of things that kids like to do that their parents either don't like to do themselves or they may disagree. So, I mean, can't we boil it down to something? I mean, I think we need to get something concrete here. Well, I was asking her if she would disagree with him wanting to, let's say he wants to go see that. How would you feel about him going to see a movie that has ghosts and supernatural beings and demons and things? Objection. What's the basis of your objection? My objection is based on relevance. Again, I think we're just trying to get to the back door of religion again. Sustained. How about uh, a classic? The Wizard of Oz. How would you feel about him watching The Wizard of Oz? Objection. Sustained. Okay. I want to talk to you now about blood. You have donated blood before, have you not? No, I've never donated blood. You did not donate blood at Pikes Peak in 1980? Objection, relevance. Overruled. No. If your parents said that you donated blood in Pikes Peak in 1980, they would not be right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Did you consult with Calvin before you made the decision that Alex would not receive a blood transfusion? I'm sorry, repeat the question. Did you consult with Calvin before you made the decision that Alex would not receive a blood transfusion? Objection. Overruled. I made the decision that I would not receive a blood transfusion. That's something we never discussed. And you also had Dr. San Jorge, who is Alex's pediatrician, you had her write it right on his card, did you not? I believe it's on this chart, yes. That wasn't the question, ma'am. You've got to please, please listen carefully and, and try to answer his specific questions, if you would, please. Did, did you tell Dr. San Jorge or did you ask San, Dr. San Jorge to put no blood transfusions on Alex's card at her office? I didn't tell her to do that, no. Did you ask her to? No, I did not. How in the world would she get that information written right on Alex's card? I told her that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and that I myself would not, I do not want a blood transfusion, I do not want one for my son. And then that's how it got on the card, right? That's, that's correct. Okay. You feel that blood does not save lives, correct? Objection. Relevant. Overruled. As we heard the testimony yesterday, Dr. Patel, in the situation that you had drawn out for him, when you asked the question, about if the blood would save his life, I believe the answer was no. So no, I don't believe that blood saves lives. You reached that opinion before Dr. Patel ever came on the scene, didn't you? Yes, I did. All right. And you can't even imagine giving your consent to a blood transfusion for Alex, can you? I would give my consent to a safer transfusion. I would want the best medical attention for my son. I would want the more superior 
transfusion for my son, and I would give my consent for that. All right, now answer my question. Can you imagine giving your consent to a blood transfusion for Alex, your son? My consent is not necessary. It would, it, all it needs is one parent's consent. His father can certainly give that consent. Okay. I am going to ask you one more time. Can you imagine giving your consent to a blood transfusion for your son, Alex? Again, as I testified before... Excuse me, that just requires a yes or a no answer? No, I would not give my consent. Thank you. So, if there was a choice, and your choice alone, between giving Alex a blood transfusion that would save his life, <coughs> or not giving that blood transfusion, you would choose not to give the blood transfusion, correct? Objection. We're calling for speculation that um, just puts her in a situation where she has to choose between her religion or her son. And what she said is that she would act in the best interest of her son. Sustained. I don't want to cut you off. Let me just say this. I mean, we're really getting to a point where I'm starting to get all blooded out. You know, I mean, right. we've had so much testimony, and, and uh, I really don't think there's anything else you can add to it. Your blood is boiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to say that either. All right. Mrs. Dodd, have you come across any issue or position that the Watchtower takes a stance on that you disagree with? Objection. Sustained. Mrs. Dodd, do you doubt that your husband loves Alex as much as you do? I have no doubt. Okay. And you don't doubt that Calvin is well able to take care of your son, don't you? I know he's, able, he's capable, yes. He's a capable parent, parent just as I am. Right. And Calvin has family living here. Alex has an aunt and an uncle and cousins that live here, doesn't he? That's correct. Right. And he has grandparents who live in Texas that love him very much, don't they? Undoubtedly, yes. Okay. And he has grandparents who live in Colorado who love him very much, don't they? Yes, they do. And he has an aunt and uh, cousins in Colorado as well, correct? That's correct. All right. okay. I have no other questions. Call your next witness, please. Okay. Rebuttal? You bet. Melinda Grimard. I object to calling the Linda Grimard at this point. Well, let's hear what she's going to say first. Or let's, 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 let's give him a shot. I mean, he's brought her all this distance. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to admit it, but let's... Melinda Grimard. Some of it might be relevant. I don't know. here yesterday, uh, you had told us that you were once one of Jehovah's Witnesses, correct? Yes. And you were uh, kicked out when you started asking questions? Yes. Okay. Were you also kicked out of your parents' home? Yes, I was. Okay. Could you tell us what happened? Objection. We still have a situation that's not relevant to this situation. What is the relevance of that question? If Alex starts asking questions, he will get disfellowshipped like this young lady did, and he will be kicked out of the home with his belongings put out on the street like this young lady had. I think you need to ask his mother whether, if that were to occur, whether she would put him out bag and baggage. I mean, what other people do 
because she answered on, on cross-examination, there were several areas where she stated that she either did not believe or would not comply with certain of the tenets of this religion. So what, what does it go to show? What is the relevance of showing what others do? Well, Your Honor, just because she says it doesn't mean we have to believe it. And I have the right to impeach that. And the way I'm going to impeach that is by showing that all other Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, have to subscribe to the rules and regulations and the tenets. You don't have a choice. You either do them or you get kicked out. The wife is saying, oh no, you have a choice to do this. We will discuss it, and if he wants to do it, if he wants to participate in an extracurricular activity, I will let him do it. Your Honor, the testimony from this witness and from the other witnesses that I want to call will show that no Jehovah's Witness ever participates in extracurricular activities. You're not allowed to do that. And that's the rules that you have to go by. Just because the wife says it, doesn't mean it's so. And that's what impeachment is for, Your Honor. She's admitted that she's a Jehovah's Witness. She's admitted that she goes, she reads the Awake, she reads the Watchtower, things like that. I want to show that what she's saying is not accurate. I want to show, like the question I asked her, do you know of any Jehovah's Witness child that was a Cub Scout? Do you know of any Jehovah's Witness child that participates on an extracurricular activity? She says, I don't know of any, or, or you wouldn't let me ask her that. I want to show through this witness and these others, they just don't do it. They ain't allowed. I'm not going to permit the questioning. Okay. I would like to proffer her testimony. Sure. Okay. I'll sit down on the bench while you proffer on the record. Let me know when All you're right. through. Okay. Melinda, when you were disfellowshipped. <clears throat> were you living in your parents' home? Yes, I was. Did they kick you out? Yes, they Objection. did. Did they put your belongings out on the street? Yes. Okay. Do you speak to your parents anymore? No. How long has it been? Five years. I want to talk to you about extracurricular activities. When you were in school, were you allowed to participate in extracurricular activities? Objection. No. Okay. I will let you have a standing objection on relevance to every question, if you would like. Okay. All right. Were you allowed to participate on any sports teams? No. Was that against the rules of the organization? Yes. Okay. Do you know any Jehovah's Witness child who participated on an extracurricular team? No. Were you allowed to go to the prom in high school? No. Were you allowed to play with other children who were not Jehovah's Witnesses after school? No, it's discouraged. It's discouraged. Okay. Let me ask you about college. Were you encouraged to go to college? No, just to go to Bethel. What's Bethel? Bethel is where all the magazines are made and distributed to the congregations around the world. Did you have good grades in high school? Yes. Did you want to go to college? Yes, I did. But your parents discouraged you from going? Right. Let me ask you about Armageddon. <clears throat> what were you told about Armageddon? That it's going to be the great battle where God destroys all the wicked people. Who and are the wicked just, people? Um, all the non-witnesses. All the non-Jehovah's Witnesses? Mm -hmm. Did they say when that was going to occur? Mm, they keep saying it's, it's closer, it keeps coming closer. Did they say anything about the generation that was starting with 1914 would be the last generation? Yes. So the generation that started in 1914 is now 76 years old, right? Roughly. And that's the last generation before Armageddon? Right. Were you afraid when you were growing up that Armageddon was going to be very near? Mm-hmm. Let me ask you about pioneering or going door to door. Were you required to do that? Yes, every Saturday. For how long? Um, two to three hours. 
were you always encouraged to do more and more and more pioneering? Yes. Okay. When you would talk to your parents about a career, what did, kind of career did they encourage you to take up? Pioneering. Full time? Full time. Let me ask you about getting married. Were you encouraged to get married? No. No, it was, it was left to your own conscience, but they discouraged it so that you'd have more time to go out in service. How about having children? That was also discouraged. This way you could go as a team if you were married, out in service. Right. Let me ask you about reading books other than Watchtower publications. How did they feel about that? They discouraged it. They, um, if you have time to read those books, and you have time to keep reading more literature. More Watchtower literature? Yes. So they discouraged you reading novels and things like that? Mm -hmm. You have to answer yes or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> How about TV? Um, were there certain things that you were not allowed to watch on TV? Yes, anything that had violence, magic, things like that. Okay. Even some cartoons you weren't allowed to watch? Yes. In, when you were in school, uh, public school, uh, and there would be a uh, holiday party, a Christmas party or an Easter party, something like that, what were you required to do? I had to excuse myself and go to the library. I couldn't participate in those parties. Did your parents say that that's what you were required to do? Yes, they also wrote letters. They wrote letters to, to the tell school? the teachers to excuse me. <coughs> Let me ask you about other religious literature. Were you allowed to read re literature that was published and printed by other religions? No, you're supposed to throw it away as soon as you got it. So if you took it home to your house, what would happen? Well, you'd be opening up yourself to let Satan into your home, and this could cause doubts and pull you away from the organization. Would your parents take that literature away from you? Yes, they would just throw it away as soon as it come in the mail. Are you allowed to go, or strike that, were you allowed to go to other places of worship, like a church, for no. a wedding? No. Were you allowed to go to other places of worship, like a church or a temple, for a funeral? No. The meetings at the Kingdom Hall, you were required to attend those? Yes. Was it more important that you attend a meeting at the Kingdom Hall than study for a test at school the next day? Yes, if it fell on that day. When you were at the Kingdom Hall as a child, were you required to sit next to your parents? Yes. Were you allowed to leave? No, except to go to the bathroom. Except to go to the bathroom, all right. <laughs> um, if the child misbehaved, or was squirmish or wasn't uh, being nice and quiet during this meeting, what happened? It was taken to the back of the Kingdom Hall till it was orderly again and then they could return with the parent back to the seat. Were there, was there any physical punishment inflicted on the child? Yes, and some of the kids, yes. I don't have any other questions. Across. I do object to the testimony offered by this witness um, for several reasons. First, she's listed as an expert witness and there's been no attempt to qualify her as such. Uh, second, all the testimony which she has given is irrelevant, it's hearsay, and she lacks confidence to offer testimony which is relevant to the best interest of Alan's dog. I guess we need the judge. Right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I did my direct. 
made their objections. They didn't do any cross. Okay. Okay, so we concluded with this witness. Okay, thank you very much. Sir, is it you wrote the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. your name and spell your last name, please. Dwayne Magnani, M-A-G-N-A-N-I. Where do you live? 5733 Verna Way, Clayton, California. Is that Northern California? Yes, it is. What is your occupation? I am a writer and I'm a director of an organization called Witness Incorporated. It's a comparative religion research group. How long have you been engaged in that activity? Since 1975. Tell us exactly what your work involves. Well, I do daily research in the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses detailing the sociological and uh, doctrinal issues that Jehovah's Witnesses are involved in. Have you written any books on this subject? Yes, I've got 19 books in publication right now, and uh, one of them with uh, Bethany House Publishers and the other 18 with Witness Incorporated. How do you do your research? Well, daily I research the original uh, literature of Jehovah's Witnesses. We have compiled the world's largest library of Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publications. And so consequently, I do my research in primary documents. So outside of the Watchtower Library in New York, you have the largest library of their literature? This is true. Okay. Do you have any personal involvement with the Jehovah's Witnesses? I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness child uh, for about 10 years, and then later I was associated with them uh, during the year of 1974. After leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses, have you talked to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes, uh, I talk to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses uh, every week for the last probably 15 years, and probably uh, 1,000 or more. Have you also spoken to current Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes, generally uh, almost every week. Have you done research on the lifestyle of uh, Jehovah's Witness children? Yes, I have. I've done extensive research on, on the subject of Jehovah's Witness children, and I've written three books on, the, on that subject. What are the names of those books? The first one is called Cruel and Unusual Punishment. The second one is called Sales Kids, and the third one is called Refutation of Preparing for Child Custody Cases. Why was Refutation for Preparing for Child Custody Cases prepared? Because uh, there is a booklet that Jehovah's Witnesses have used with their attorneys called Preparing for Child Custody Cases, and that booklet uh, is refuted in the publication I just mentioned called Refutation of Preparing for Child Custody Cases. And the reason why I'm refuting it is because it contains a lot of erroneous and false information that the Jehovah's Witnesses bring out in court. Why was Preparing for Child Custody Cases published by the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, it's a strategy. Basis. Have you read Preparing for Child Custody Cases? Yes, I have. And does that publication indicate the purpose of that book or that publication? Yes, in the introduction of the publication, it, it says that the, the booklet has been prepared to prepare the Jehovah's Witness for a child custody case and give instruction to the attorneys in regards to the information to be brought out about lifestyle about Jehovah's Witnesses. Lifestyle of the children? Yes, it is expected they say in the booklet that the lifestyle of Jehovah's Witnesses will be discussed in court. Okay. Do you have a copy of that? Yes, I do. May I see it? This is the book? 
Yes, it is. Your Honor, I would offer Mr. Magnani as an expert witness in this case to testify on the lifestyle of Jehovah's Witness children and on the rules, regulations, and policies of Jehovah's Witnesses and how the children of Jehovah's Witnesses' parents are supposed to comply with them. Objection is sustained. I need then to proffer his testimony. And this is going to be a lengthy one. There is no need for an expert witness. Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs in teaching are not a relevant issue. Dwayne Magnani is not an expert, not qualified as such, and that this is a violation of both the Florida State Constitution, Freedom of Religion, Article I, Section 3, as well as the federal constitution. All fundamental rights, including religion, association, are being violated by the offer of this man's testimony. Go ahead. Mr. Magnani, how much do the Jehovah's Witnesses rely on their leaders for lifestyle decisions? The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that their organization leadership is a direct channel for God, and therefore, since they believe God, they believe that the channel speaks for God and therefore totally rely on it 100%. Do Jehovah's Witness parents personally make decisions that affect their child's lives? Yes, they do. Are Jehovah's Witnesses told to avoid independent thinking? Yes, in fact, that is actually in print by the organization, avoid independent thinking. They are not allowed, as Jehovah's Witnesses, by their belief structure, to think independently of the organization, again, who they believe is God's channel of communication. To think independently would be to go against God. As a matter of fact, do they not refer to the organization as mother? Yes, they believe that Jehovah is the father of the people of God and the organization is collectively the mother of the people of God. Do you have some written examples of this concept of avoiding independent thinking? Yes, I do. Could you share those with us, please? Certainly. For example, in the Watchtower dated January 15, 1983, page 22 and 27, it is said, quote, under the heading, avoid independent thinking. From the very outset of his rebellion, Satan called into question God's way of doing things. He promoted independent thinking. Then they go on to say, how is such independent thinking manifested? A common way is by questioning the counsel that is provided by God's visible organization. Then they say, such thinking is an evidence of pride, and the Bible says pride is before a crash and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Then they say, if we get to thinking that we know better than the organization, we should ask ourselves, where did we learn Bible truth in the first place? Would we know the way of the truth if it had not been for guidance from the organization? Really, can we get along without the direction of God's organization? No, we cannot, quote, unquote. That's one example. There are numerous examples of that in the literature. Are Jehovah's Witnesses censored or prohibited from listening to, viewing, or reading religious literature that expresses opinions contrary to the Watchtower? Certainly. Since they believe it's God's organization, they believe that other literature, other religious viewpoints, is what they consider religious poison. A good example of that is in the Watchtower dated 11-187, pages 19 and 20. I'll just read you a short excerpt to explain what I mean. Under the subheading, Keeping Spiritually Clean, they say, quote, Some have exposed themselves to possible spiritual contamination by tuning into religious radio and television broadcasts. Then they go on to say that this is an example of independent thinking, which is what I just referred to earlier. Then another statement on page 20 of this article. 
it says, false religious propaganda from any source should be avoided like poison. What and are they supposed to do with literature if they receive it? Uh, they are supposed to uh, destroy the literature. They are supposed to not read the literature. <coughs> Does following Watchtower Society rules involve spying on other Jehovah's Witnesses and engaging in unethical and possibly even illegal activities? Yes, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that their organization, since it is their mother, should be told of any infractions of the rules or policies laid down by the mother organization such as if a Jehovah's Witness was seen to be smoking, for instance, another Jehovah's Witness should turn that person in to the organization for a hearing, and that person who did the smoking would then be, uh, it would be considered whether that person should be disfellowshipped or not. Smoking uh, is a smoking disfellowshipping is, offense? Is a disfellowshipping uh, offense considered by Jehovah's Witnesses, and the reason why it's considered is because the organization has mandated it a disfellowshipping offense. Are there circumstances or instances where Jehovah's Witnesses have breached confidentiality privileges, such as the doctor-patient privilege? Yes. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, again, that, uh, that their organization is God's channel. And this organization has stated that, for instance, if you are an employee of a doctor, and uh, you find out by perhaps looking through some records that one of his patients is a Jehovah's Witness. Now, you're a Jehovah's Witness as the employee, and the patient is a Jehovah's Witness. If you find out by looking at the records that that patient has violated one of the mandates of the Watchtower organization, such as, for instance, uh, received an abortion, or uh, is getting counseling for smoking, or some infraction, uh, getting uh, uh, if, if underage, getting birth control pills, things like this, uh, then you should turn in that information to the elders at the Kingdom Hall. Now, this is full well known by the organization and in print that this could well be a violation of the law and certainly a violation of the oath that the Jehovah's Witness took upon taking the particular job with the doctor. However, they feel that the law of the organization is higher, so therefore they're willing to break the oath the person gave at the job interview. And that, you say, is in print? That is in print. Okay. Right. Let's talk about view of the future. Are Jehovah's Witnesses optimistic or pessimistic about the near future of this world? Well, they're extremely pessimistic. Jehovah's Witnesses are not looking to the destruction of the planet but they are looking for the destruction of all non-Jehovah's Witnesses. This is to take place generally believed by Jehovah's Witnesses within the next decade, by the end of the century. Do you have written examples of that? Uh, yes, I do. Could you I share do. those with us? Yes, I can. For example, um, in the Awake magazine of 11826, uh, pages uh, 7 and 8, uh, this is an example here of how children believe that the end of the world is coming very soon. Under the subheading, The Time for a Change is Near, the statement is made, quote, Samuel, a 15-year-old youth from the same country, also believes in a complete change. Quote, for the year 2000, I, vi I visualize a world transformed into a beautiful paradise. But I don't think that either the present world or its rulers will live to see that day. We are living in the last days of this system of things. That's actually, I think you said, 
11826. It's actually 118986, correct? I'm sorry. It is 118986, pages uh, 7 and 8. And then the Watchtower organization, in commenting on what Samuel said there, says, quote, a close, ex close examination of Bible prophecies showed these young witnesses that we are now living in a privileged period of history. For the time has come for God to intervene in human affairs and rid the entire earth of unrighteousness. And then they go on to say, this short period preceding God's intervention, quote, from the time of the end, unquote, and specify that it will not last longer than a quote, unquote, generation. All right, so the witnesses have been told uh, that the organization, the leadership, God's channel, believes that the end is very, very close. And so the Hill history of the organization has been a series over the last hundred some odd years of dates for the end of the world. And people have uh, uh, justified various practices that they have in terms of uh, uh, selling homes, uh, uh, not uh, getting higher education, uh, getting part-time work, all for the reason that the end of the world is coming very soon. What should we do about it? We should go door to door and tell people about it. And that is an urgent situation for Jehovah's Witnesses. The parents believe this, and naturally they teach their children this. The children then believe it and do not look for a long, uh, they do not have a long-term world view. Since non-Jehovah's Witnesses are not going to survive this Armageddon, how does that relate to this case where Mr. Dodd is not a Jehovah's Witness, but his wife is, and how the child will be taught. Well, the child, in regards to the father, Mr. Dodd, if he accepts the teachings that he hears at the Kingdom Hall, and uh, from the mother, if the mother is a Jehovah's Witness, uh, according to all the research I've done and the interviews I've done and the life I've lived as a Jehovah's Witness, she will in fact teach the Jehovah's Witness beliefs to the child. And if she does, those beliefs will in entail an understanding on the part of the child that the father does not have long to live, that the father is doomed to die shortly. Also, that, uh, that since the father is not a Jehovah's Witness, the only one surviving will be Jehovah's Witnesses, and therefore the future of the child, it is believed, will only be with Jehovah's Witnesses. So in other words, the child is going to be taught that his father is going to die very soon. Yes. Likewise for his grandparents, his aunts, his uncles, his cousins who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. That's correct. Every non-Jehovah's Witness is doomed, according to the Watchtower Organization, and justifiably so, because they are sinners who have not accepted the teachings of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Do the, are the Jehovah's Witness children encouraged to go out door-to-door -door pioneering, even at a young age? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness children are encouraged to become as active as, as uh, they can within what's called field service, which is the door-to-door -door, uh, publishing of the literature which uh, is published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Uh, and many examples of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses pioneering or, or going into full-time mission work at very un young ages, such as uh, the mid-teens, as a matter of fact, and even younger, are given in the literature of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is done to encourage Jehovah's Witnesses, and particularly the children, as to what God wants for them, which is not a career in this system of things, but a, an opportunity to serve God in the door-to-door -door activity. Okay. Does the Jehovah's Witness lifestyle affect a child's relationship with non-Jehovah's Witness children? Uh, yes, it certainly does. How does it do that? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that their classmates at, at work, I mean at school, excuse me, or uh, their friends in the neighborhood will be living very long. These kids are also doomed to death uh, within the next decade or so. So naturally, uh, they are not looking for any long-term relationships with these children. Their parents are also telling them generally that these children uh, have immoral ways about them because their parents are under the control of Satan. In other words, that since the children they, at school and in the neighborhood who are not Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are not being taught by the Watchtower Organization, then they are, quote, unquote, bad associations for the Jehovah's Witness child. There is only one 
what you might call a loophole in terms of any possible association with a non-Jehovah's Witness child. And that is, the Jehovah's Witness child is told that he could bring this non-Jehovah's Witness child to the Kingdom Hall or uh, into a situation in which that non-Jehovah's Witness child could learn about the truth as taught by Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's the only kind of non-association, I mean non-Jehovah's uh, Witness association that's allowed. In other words, to try and convert that child? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Right. Okay. How about things such as school dances and dating? Are they encouraged or discouraged? Uh, school dances and uh, dating are both uh, discouraged by the organization and therefore by the Jehovah's Witness parents. How about allowing the children to participate in extracurricular activities, school plays, school bands? Uh, these would be considered generally bad association again because the Jehovah's Witness child would be uh, dealing with unwholesome associations, i.e. non-Jehovah's Witness children. So therefore any activities such as the extracurricular activities, uh, would not be encouraged. Okay. Let me ask you this. Mrs. Dodd has said that if little Alex wanted to, say, play on the football team, and he said, Mommy, I want to play on the football team, Mrs. Dodd has said, well, I'll call Calvin, her husband, and we will discuss it. Uh, have you ever heard of a situation where it's, quote, discussed and then whatever little Alex wants to do, he's allowed to do in that regard? No, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, I have never heard in all my interviews and in my long association personally as a Jehovah's Witness child uh, of a Jehovah's Witness parent uh, discussing such a thing with a non-Jehovah's Witness parent simply for the reason that she would believe that the thinking apparatus, the, uh, in the case of Mr. Dodd, that he would be guided in his thinking by Satan, because Satan is his god as far as Mrs. Dodd is concerned. Therefore, to ask someone who was guided by Satan something important about her child in terms of what kind of activity the child should be involved in is ludicrous. Uh, number two, uh, it is also even more ludicrous to, to, to think that the, the mother would actually uh, get into a conversation with her child in terms of making a decision as to what he will be doing in life in terms of extracurricular activity or whatnot. Uh, Jehovah's Witness parents do not make decisions with their children, they make them for the children and the decisions are already made for the parents anyway in the literature. What about things such as running for student council in school? Would they be allowed to do that? No. Uh, Jehovah's Witness children are not allowed to be involved in what, they cons in what the, the organization considers school politics, quote unquote. Uh, so the child would not be allowed to be involved in school activities uh, such as that because, again, they would be considered extracurricular, which would be discouraged bad associations, again that would be discouraged, and uh, it would have the, uh, the smell, if you will, of the greater political atmosphere that Jehovah's Witnesses are against. In other words, uh, the world of politics, they are, they are against that. What about something as innocent as the chess club at school? Uh, chess is a game that is generally discouraged among Jehovah's Witnesses because it's a military game. It's considered a military game. It's a game of strategy in which they believe that the opponents in the chess match are out to get each other in a military way. It's in essence almost, almost uh, like war. And therefore uh, chess is, is de de has been determined by the organization as not necessarily the healthiest game a Jehovah's Witness can, child can be involved in or an adult. How about activities associated with uh, the national holidays? Are they allowed to participate in those? 
No, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are forbidden from participation in any, any holidays at all. Mrs. Dodd has said that if by chance she went to a uh, baseball game here to watch a baseball game and at the start of the game they play the national anthem and if little Alex, age six, wanted to stand up and sing the national anthem, she would let him do that and that would be okay with her. Uh, do you find that to be accurate in your experience with the over thousand Jehovah's Witnesses and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses that you have talked to? I've never heard of such a thing, sir. Uh, Jehovah's Witness parents believe that to stand up for the national anthem is tantamount to a creature worship, worshiping the country. It's an abomination in the sight of Jehovah God. Therefore, any, any Jehovah's Witness parent who allows his child to, to be involved in the national anthem or flag saluting uh, is going against God's law, and it's uh, considered something that uh, uh, would be some, an infraction of the Watchtower policy. The Jehovah's Witness would be hauled before the elders in the congregation, reprimanded. Uh, perhaps drastic action could be taken. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous to think in terms of, of a Jehovah's Witness parent allowing such a thing. What are Jehovah's Witness children taught about other religions? Uh, other religions are considered under the agency of Satan. Uh, there is an abundant amount of literature which the society has published over many, many, many years about the beliefs and practices of other religion. Uh, in my investigation, I have not found one article published by the organization which is favorable in any way towards the practices of these other religions. They are lumped together as being Satan's organization, Babylon the Great, and so forth. Uh, so consequently, um, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and their children are taught that other religions are of the devil and to be avoided at all costs. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, they are not to read, they are not to see, and they are not to hear the opinions of other religions. What is the Jehovah's Witness child going to be taught by, say, Mrs. Dodd about Mr. Dodd's religion? Well, uh, Mr. Dodd's religion or philosophy or whatever he has is considered, again, of Satan. And Mr. Dodd uh, is, uh, by having that particular philosophy, which is not the philosophy or religion of Jehovah's Witnesses, is an agent of Satan. Are Jehovah's Witnesses truthful with non-Jehovah's Witnesses? The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that uh, to lie to someone is to tell a falsehood to someone who is entitled to know the truth. And what I mean by that is they believe that Jehovah's Witnesses as God's people are people of the truth, i.e. they are following God's channel, which is located in Brooklyn, New York, and therefore they are all God's family, a truthful people, and therefore they're entitled to know the truth. Mr. Dodd and others who are not Jehovah's Witnesses are not entitled to know the truth um, because, again, they're agents of Satan. They are on the outside, and so therefore, consequently, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses will often uh, promote what, what is called theocratic warfare. When they are in a situation, for instance, which may be extremely embarrassing to, to uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, such as the, this particular court hearing, uh, they will uh, fabricate, make up, misconstrue, um, uh, misinstruct the court and other people about their lifestyle. Now, the reason for this is because the court is also an agent of Satan. Uh, everything outside of Jehovah's Witnesses, again, is an agent of Satan and is not entitled to know the truth. So consequently, the lifestyle that is presented to the court and to non-Jehovah's Witnesses in general is uh, made up, it is fictitious, in the sense that the, since the court and outsiders would be perhaps appalled at some of the things that really go on in the organization and the way that the children are really being treated consequently and it might be detrimental to the Jehovah's Witnesses many things have been made up that are that are not true 
let's say that uh, Alexander uh, became baptized as Jehovah's Witness and then he decided or he did something uh, that would cause him to be disfellowshipped or, or he decided he wanted to leave the organization uh, how would he be treated by his mother? Uh, his mother first of all would hate him uh, that is in the literature of the organization and if she is a Jehovah's Witness uh, to my understanding she is she is instructed to consider him as a hater of God someone who has left God's pure organization and therefore she must turn against her child and cut off any natural affection for the child in the sense that there would not be any normal activity between the two anymore if the child has reached the age of majority once the child has left the home particularly the normal uh, family relationships should cease according to the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Should she avoid him? At all costs. Thank you, Mr. Magnani. talk about degrees Fahrenheit. Your wife said that it was 63 degrees Fahrenheit when you brought him back the other day in a either a t-shirt or a tank top and shorts. Um, first of all, was that on one of your Tuesday, Thursday visitations? Yes, that was last week and it was so close to this court date, my parents were even in town, that she said it's freezing out here and you brought him back in a t-shirt and shorts. So I, I, for some reason, I thought that might come up in court. So I ran home and I called temperature right in front of my parents, and it was 70 degrees. And so I didn't think that was really freezing. And on that visitation uh, day, you got Alex from Pat, correct? Yes. What was Alex's condition when you got him that day? Well, I don't know the correct word, but uh, I guess I'm safe to say he had baby poop all over him. Um, he had leg. on his shoe and on his leg and on his pants. And so I, I, all I could do was put him in the car and take him home and give him a bath. And you had to wash the clothes that your wife gave right. him to you in? Oh, sure. Took, took all the clothes off he had, washed him, and dressed him. That's where he came up with the T-shirt the and shorts. Okay. And this past uh, Thanksgiving when she denied you visitation, you, wanted, you would like to have spent Thanksgiving Day with him, which is a Thursday, right? Yes. Um, I don't think Thanksgiving, I don't, I mean, it's hard to recall, but I do not believe that um, when she was letting me see him the every other weekend at that time, um, that, right, one of the days, it was Thanksgiving or Halloween, it did not fall on her weekend, but that was definitely a day she did not want me to see him. Thanksgiving always th falls on a Thursday, right? Right. Okay. I have no other questions, John. Cross? How many weekends have you had Alex for overnight visitation? I guess that'd be both Friday and Saturday night, right? Yes, Friday and Saturday night. Excuse me, Your Honor, I object it's beyond the scope of direct examination. No, it's not. Overruled. How many weekends, sir? Um, since I was allowed to see him by Judge Kirsten, or before that? Yeah, let's just let's just go no further back in time than January would be I don't know I lived I mean we lived together up until what March or something like that no 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 no. just uh, through last January just go back to last January okay oh from January till now January 1990 through now every other weekend <laughs> well let's say two what maybe seven weekends eight weekends has Alex ever had an accident while he was visiting you? Um, no. Once again, I object. It's beyond the scope. Overruled. 
I believe you're the ones who introduced fecal material this afternoon. I believe that's the type of I believe that's the kind of accident he's talking about. Are you not? No, no serious accidents. I'm not even a father, for Pete's sake. Or similar accidents, Judge. An accident in quotes, euphemistically used, and that's never happened. No serious accidents. I mean, um, he will get little cuts and scrapes on him and little bruises. That's sure. not the sort of accident I'm talking about. No, he didn't break his arm or anything like that. No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm talking about accidents of a less serious nature, perhaps involving the fecal material that you were referring to just a moment ago. Not that I recall. Well, you must have the magic touch. I don't have anything else. I'll object and move to strike that comment. The comment will be struck. You may, you may be seated, sir. Thank you very much. Call your last witness, please. Betty Galloway. We object to this witness. <laughs> on what grounds? Not on the pretrial statement. Your Honor, Betty Galloway is the child's daycare center. Daycare person. I don't see any surprise in calling her this time to ask her really one question. It goes towards impeachment, too. I'm not permitted. You may call her. Betty Galloway? Yeah. Is it your oath the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Great. Thank you. Tell us your name. My name is Betty Galloway. Where do you live? I live at 4021 Waverly Drive, West Palm Beach. You currently take care of Alex uh, Dodd? Yes, I do. Ms. Galloway, if someone said about Alex that he does not interact or play with other children, would that be an accurate description of the Alex that you know? No, it's not. Mrs. Galloway, uh, Mrs. Dodd said that about Alex in her deposition under oath. Well, I didn't know that, but I do. I don't have any other questions. You're a witness. A slight problem, Judge. I heard the, I, I, I failed to hear one of the questions that Mr. Whit Richardson asked this witness. I'm wondering if co-counsel's hearing was a little bit better than mine a moment ago. Or we can read it back, that's okay. Mrs. Galloway, do you take care of any other uh, children of Alex's age? Yes, I do. And how long have you been doing that? I've been doing it now over a year. Okay. Sort of over a year. Would it be fair to say that in your experience it is usual for children of Alex's age to play with other children? Excuse me, Your Honor. Is he now trying to make her an expert witness? Her expert witness opinion. I'm only asking her what she's seen over the course of the are you, last are year. Are you objecting? Yes, I object. Sustained. I'll rephrase. Of the other children that you have had in your care over the last year or so, ma'am, would you say it is usual for them to play with other children? usual. They interact. They play. It's nothing unusual. But Alex does not? Yes, Alex do. Alex does? Yes. Okay. Nothing else. 
Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate your assistance. Mr. Richardson, do you want to split your time? I think I, I better, Your Honor. How do you want to split it? I have 15 total. Yes, sir. Let me choose lucky 13 and 2. So you want a two-minute warning, OK. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll, I will give each party a two-minute warning in each segment anyway. Time you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, what is in Alex's best interest? We're talking about his physical, his intellectual, his moral, and his spiritual well being. Your Honor is well aware and has recognized that there is no tender years presumption in this state. We need to consider certain factors that are set forth in the statute. The first of which is the frequent and continuing contact with the non residential parent. The testimony has shown that the wife has denied the husband visitation in the past. She has denied the husband's parents visitation in the past. She says that her relationship with her parents has gotten better in the last four months, but that strikes me as odd because it was only last Christmas that she was in here vehemently opposing Mr. Dodd taking her son to visit her parents in Colorado. Mrs. Dodd does not want my client to have visitation with Cal, uh, Alex on holidays that she doesn't even observe those holidays. She wants to keep him away from Mr. Dodd on the holidays. The second factor, Your Honor, is the love, affection, and emotional ties that exist between the, the parties and the child. The testimony has shown that Calvin and Alex are as close as any father and son can be. The testimony has also just shown that, according to Ms. Galloway, Alex interacts, he plays with other children. But what did Mrs. Dodd say at her deposition when I talked to her about that uh, today? Question, he plays with you, right. Question, how about with other children? Answer, he's really not at an age where he interacts with other children. How well can this mother know this child if she doesn't know that he interacts with other children and plays with them? third factor, Your Honor, is the capacity and the disposition to provide food, clothing, medical care, and other material needs. Now, we all have to admit that Alex can be fed, clothed, and bathed probably just as well by his father as he can by his mother. Calvin, though, is going to be getting a two-bedroom apartment where Alex is going to have his own bedroom. Mrs. Dodd is going to continue to have him in a one-bedroom apartment. Now, let's talk about medical care, and let's focus in on the word in the statute, disposition. Mrs. Dodd will not consent under any circumstances to letting Alex get a blood transfusion. Your Honor even asked her, if two doctors, Mrs. Dodd, said he needs a blood transfusion, would you consent? She says no. You know, I I have to say, Your Honor, that uh, maybe Mrs. Dodd, when she goes to the emergency room, should have a sign around her that says, don't ask me, I'm only his mom. Or maybe she should carry a sign that says, just say no, you know, with the uh, circle through a uh, pint of blood. She would, I think, rather he die than get a blood transfusion. Are we going to take that chance with Alex's life? I don't think that we should take that chance. Calvin would unhesitatingly provide that for Alex if that's what the doctor said. The next factor, Your Honor, is the length of time that the child has lived in a satisfactory and stable environment. Well, how stable is the environment that he is currently in with his mother? How much quality time do they spend together? 
She gets him up at 7.30. They rush out the door so that she can go to work. He's in daycare all day. She comes home between 6 and 6.30, and his normal bedtime is at 8. How much quality time does she have with that child? On Tuesdays and Thursdays, if she had her druthers, she would be taking him to the Kingdom Hall, where he would be up until 9.30 or 10 o'clock. On the other hand, the husband is able to leave for his job at 9 o'clock in the morning, giving him nice quality time with the child in the morning. He's also home by 6 o'clock every night. He doesn't have meetings at night that he needs to go to, either at the Kingdom Hall or somebody else's house. Even Mrs. Dodd admits that it's in Alex's best interest to spend time with his parents. If Alex is with his father, he will be able to spend more time, more good time, more quality time with his father. The next factor is the permanence as a family unit of the respective households. Well, the Dodds have testified. The Dodds are a close, loving family. They're supportive. They are always there for each other. Mr. Dodd's brother lives with him. Mr. Dodd's sister and her family live a mile away. They're very close. They get together. On the other hand, the wife is estranged from her parents, her sister, her nieces, and nephews. She has not been home to visit her parents or her family in three years. Even Mrs. Dodd's parents want Calvin to become the primary residential parent. The next two factors, Your Honor, I think are a draw. That's the moral fitness of the parents. I think they're both moral. The evidence has shown that. Also, the mental and physical health. I think they're both physically and mentally healthy uh, from what the evidence has shown. The next factor is the home, school, and community record of the child. Well, he hasn't uh, started school yet or become active in the community, but let's look at what it will be. Will he be, dis be discouraged? Will there be hesitation on letting him participate in school activities? Your Honor yourself asked her the question, what if he wants to take part in the Thanksgiving activities at school and he comes home and he wants to do the smock and the hat for the pilgrim? No, I'm not going to help him with that. I don't want him to do that. Interestingly, Your Honor, Mrs. Dodd says that the book, School and Jehovah's Witnesses, and I read some things to her out of that, uh, that's only for married parents. And how does she know that? Ms. Wall. Her lawyer told her that that's for married parents only. It doesn't apply to divorced parents. Funny. College, his career. Mrs. Dodd says, I don't feel college is necessary. Why should you go to college to get a four-year degree? Don't waste your time. Well, Mrs. Dodd has used her college degree. It's been admittedly beneficial to her. Mr. Dodd has used his college degree. I find it hard to fathom that anybody in this day and age would say that college is not necessary. The last factor, Your Honor, is any other factor that you deem to be relevant from what you have heard. And that includes any religious values or beliefs that bear an impact on the effect of the child. Now, I'm not going to talk about the law. I've given you my trial memorandum. The only thing I will say, Your Honor, is that the Florida court in Rogers versus Rogers has set forth the standard which you, must, which you may follow. It cites you to Hilly, it cites you to Hayden, and it cites you to Clift. Now, they want you to believe that, that those cases stand for the proposition that there must be a present and substantial harm to the child. You will not find that in those cases. You will find those words present and substantial harm in one case, the Osier case in Maine. It doesn't appear in any other cases, and I invite you to read the cases that are cited not only in my memorandum and in hers to see who's correctly citing the law. Your Honor, you have observed both parties' demeanor, the way they handle themselves on the stand, especially the wife's demeanor and her evasive answers. I think she has more waffles in her testimony than at a Kiwanis breakfast can't get a straight answer out of her. She hems, she haws, she hesitates. Is that what we want to see when it comes to your child? Do you hesitate? Do you hem and do you haw? Do you make life and death decisions like whether your child is going to have a blood transfusion or not and telling your pediatrician that without asking your spouse, your husband? Do you deny or do you restrict <coughs> access to his family? No, you do not do that. Your Honor, Mr. and Mrs. Dodd have started out start at the beginning of this trial as equal, but it's no longer equal. It's in Mr. Dodd's favor. A child's best interests, maybe even his life, hang in the balance right here. For Alex's todays,
for his tomorrows, for his next years, let his father be his guiding light. Make Calvin Dodd his primary residential parent. Thank you. All right. Obviously, we differ on our conclusions. In reviewing the statute, I've come to an entirely different view of the two parties as have been presented to the court. Under subsection A, where a parent is uh, chosen if he's likely to allow the other, to, to allow the child frequent and continuing contact, what we find is evidence from Mr. Daw that uh, he has deserted his wife because of his religious beliefs, her religious beliefs, and that his example, both in word and deed, shows an intolerance to his wife that will no doubt be passed on to his son. Uh, in regard to Mrs. Dodd's testimony, I think uh, the scene that she painted in which the boy uh, takes leave of his father, in which she encourages him to salute him, to wave goodbye, shows that uh, in a small way, the love and the respect that she feels that Calvin Dodd deserves as a natural father. She has indicated, too, that although their marriage is irretrievably broken, that she wants to continue to have the father involved in uh, decision-making uh, that will affect the child, whether on large scales, such as medical treatment, or even on small things as to the child's uh, activities after school. There is an emotional openness with the mother that is not present with the father, and an encouragement of mutual respect that is only present with the mother. Further, Mr. Dodd's intolerance has evidenced itself in the end of the marriage, the refusal to allow the uh, use of the name Dodd after their marriage because he does not want it associated with her religion, uh, the violence in the home which has uh, dis erupted based on conversations about religion has no doubt also been associated with disparaging remarks in the child's presence. The Dodd family has Excuse been... Excuse me, if I, I must object to that. There's been no testimony that there were disparaging remarks in the child's presence in the evidence that I heard. Well, in the testimony that Mrs. Dodd gave, when he threw her on the bed, the child was in her arms. When he accused her of uh, not wanting to study with him, the child was there present in the home. I'm going to overrule the objection. The Dodd family has been described as one with a lot of love, and that might be very true for Mr. and Mrs. Dodd, the parents, and for their children. But this love, uh, in, as well as including the Dodds within it, seems to have an excluding effect with Pat. And I think this may have a dangerous effect eventually on Alex as he begins to understand how his cousins, his aunts, and his uncle view his mother. This might have an ostracizing effect on the child. The second element referred to has to do with love and affection. It's very difficult to determine the love and affection that Alex has for his parents. Uh, as any infant would, no doubt he's attached to both. But Dr. San Jorge, who is the treating uh, physician, indicates that the child is emotionally secure and stress-free, and this in the face of an impending divorce. Her observations indicated that she wasn't even aware that the Dodds were going through a divorce based on the emotional makeup of the child. The comments of Maggie Jones were that the child appeared to love the mother and that this was mutual. And in spite of the fact that Muriel Ogden, Mrs. Dodd's mother, wants to have custody with Calvin Dodd, she cannot deny that, in her own words, she's a good mother. Even now, even in spite of her religion, and she makes it clear that the fact that the reason why she prefers uh, Calvin Dodd to Patricia Dodd is solely based on religion. Because uh, love and affection, things of this nature, are very subjective, we turn our attention more specifically to some more objective standards. And the third se uh, set of standards, which we'll look at, is capacity and disposition of the parent to provide for the child in a physical way. So the natural question comes up is to who is the primary custodian who has cared for the child? 
And without a doubt, the answer is Patricia Dodd. Since his birth, she has prepared his food, has uh, made sure he's had a balanced diet. She's the one that bathes, dresses, and grooms him. She is the one who's made provision for medical treatment through Dr. San Jorge. She's the one who goes to make sure his um, prescriptions have been filled and administers the drugs to him. She is the one who has arranged for daycare and is the one who is teaching him elementary skills uh, such as the language ability as well as toilet training and other verbal skills. Dr. San Jorge did recognize that the child does suffer from per persistent phenyl hemoglobin, but also indicates that the child's uh, adjusting well to his lower hemoglobin and receives shots as well as medication. He, she has only met Mr. Dodd one time and that was associated with litigation here today. Uh, on the other hand, she indicates in her deposition that Pat has taken him at that time in December to, the, to uh, her offices at least 14 times. At that time the child was only 17 months old. The accusation is made that because she will not consent to a blood transfusion, and this is based on her religious belief that she is not in a disposition to care for the child, and I think that's uh, short-sighted. Mrs. Dodd has testified that not only does she intend to care for the child, she has. And in the event that a physician recommends a blood transfusion in Alex's care, she is well prepared to notify the father so that he can exercise his natural, moral, legal right to give consent. Further, if for some reason Mr. Dodd is not available or not inclined to give consent, uh, she recognizes the court's authority as well as the authority of individual physicians to act without her consent if a blood transfusion is necessary. Maggie Jones, who owned the apartment house where Mr. and Mrs. Dodd lived at one time, uh, views her as a very responsible person and agreed that uh, she took care of Alice's needs. Mr. Robert Ogden, uh, the father of Mrs. Dodd also indicated that he would prefer Calvin as the custodial parent, but made it clear that it was based on his religion. The testimony of the guardian at Leiden recommended Calvin uh, Dodd as the primary custodian, but again made it clear that that was based upon a religious belief. Calvin Dodd has not participated in the health care decisions of the child and has not had experience other than the ten to eight to ten weekends which has had the child under visitation arrangement to show that he is capable of doing these things. Further, the irregular support payments which Mrs. Dodd received from Mr. Dodd through the year of 1989 uh, further indicate uh, some insecurity or uncertainty as to providing for and his capacity to provide for physical care. Uh, it would be my position that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dodd, the grandparents, are not really in a capable position to give our observation as to Calvin's position as a caretaker. When the child was with them, no doubt Mrs. Dodd uh, also participated in his care, as did the grandfather. And in a family arrangement which Calvin describes, uh, Deanne as well as Lee also share in the caretaking of the child. So this responsibility has never fallen full shoulder on Mr. Dodd, and we have no way of knowing that he is in a position to do so. We next look at the factor of stability and the length of time that, Cal that Alex has resided with his mother. He's resided with his mother since birth, and Dr. San Jorge has been a pediatrician since his birth. No doubt these things will change if Calvin Dodd is given primary custody. Maggie Jones reports the boy is happy. Just what leads you to say that, counsel? Well, Dr. San Jorge. Uh, excuse me? What leads you to say that? I heard nothing about changing phys uh, pediatricians. I heard no evidence with regard to the that. The testimony law. which uh, I recall and based the statement on is his indignation with Dr. San Jorge in finding that she had noted that there would be no blood administered to the child absent his consent. I find it hard to believe that he would continue with her, well, noting her in, position. In an argument, I'm not really interested in what you think or what you believe. I'm interested in what the evidence has shown. Well, then so let please, the evidence please show. Please limit your remarks I'm sorry. To, to what the evidence shows. If you the evidence does show in that case, then, that uh, Mr. Dodd was indignant with the fact that Dr. San Jorge had been or had shown herself possibly cooperative with his wife's position. Muriel Dodd, as well as Maggie Jones, both comment uh, in their depositions that the boy is happy, well settled, and well behaved. We, in the element of stability, we talk about quality time, and it appears to be, uh, in Mr. Dodd's eyes, that it's unstable that the mother has to leave early for work, and that the child does not have a leisurely time in which to have his breakfast, but more needs to be considered in the, uh, under the element of stability. First of all, there is quality time, and Mrs. Dodd indicated that she does make effort to spend the time with the child when the time allows in the evening as well as the weekends and has made a recent adjustment in her schedule so that Wednesdays are now free for her to spend with Alex. 
Further, she has Monday, Wednesday, and alternate Fridays available to spend with Alex when Mr. Dodd does not have visitation. Obviously, there are things that, and she has testified to, which they share together, which do not include going to the Kingdom Hall. That, too, can be included, however, as time spent with the child and should not be overlooked. Alex Dodd has resided with his mother since birth. He's attended meetings with her at the Kingdom Hall since birth. He has had the caretaker that he presently has since he was 11 months old. He has lived, um, excuse me, forget, and has been, I said that, excuse me. There's another element of stability that I'd like to look into, and that's the employment stability. Patricia Dodd has been employed by a single employer since November 1989. She also has a more flexible work schedule and seems to have a little bit more stability uh, than Mr. Dodd is regard to her religious convictions. Testimony indicated that Mr. Dodd has gone uh, from no religious practices at the beginning of his marriage uh, from a Lutheran background and is now about to become a Catholic, and uh, there is no certainty as to whether or not uh, this will continue to be his course. The moral fitness, I agree, is not called an issue, neither is the mental or physical health of the parents. But I would comment on Mr. Richardson's uh, response to the child's record in the home. I think at this point uh, it is irrelevant. He's 23 months old. But he attacks it on a position that uh, the child will not be viewed as normal, not be viewed um, unusual by his peers because he's not we wearing a pilgrim's hat on the appropriate day. But I think I would refer to the case of Johnson v. Johnson. It's an Alaska case. I know it's a remote jurisdiction, but it made an interesting I've read comment. The case. It says it is not the court's role to make us homogeneous. We're not a homogeneous society. And really, when we look at the climate in which we're raising our children today, if more children were able to say no, take a stand, and show a little backbone, independent thinking, there perhaps would be less drug problems, less peer pressure, uh, and less moral decay. That's a possibility, but I don't think it's a reason uh, for why Calvin Dodd, Alex Dodd, should not reside with his mother. As to what the law is and what the law says, the law is clear, I think. Here in Florida, there is no specific case that says how religion should be handled. Hilly v. Hilly says quite clearly that 61, a statute which we're considering now, could include religion as a factor. But I think the cases that it refers to in the footnote also bear uh, some consideration. I'm sure you've read Cliff v. Cliff, which says specifically, Questions regarding the celebration of Christmas and birthdays or relating to participation in the electoral process or military service are not within the ambit of religious views which may reasonably be construed as endangering the mental or physical health of a child. And uh, Your Honor has um, been mindful of our objections, but uh, we have been forced to listen to testimony involved in these things because uh, it has been brought into, into issue. In Ray Hardin, does hold to a lesser standard because it asks for a reasonable and substantial likelihood of immediate or future impairment. But it makes it quite clear that the burden on the non-religious parent, and for want of a better description, is to show a substantial threat to the endangering of the children's mental or physical welfare. And we have had no showing whatsoever as to some threat to Alex's welfare. We have had testimony that shows that there are differences between the way the two parents would raise their children. But it would be unfair to say that uh, different, it, differences are inherently wrong. Our society allows for a plurality, and I think among parents there should be that uh, support thereof. I refer to another case, Munez v. Munez. They involved slightly older children, but uh, the Catholic mother and the father was a member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. The children were going to both religious services. The direction the court gave in affirming the approval of this arrangement says American courts are forbidden from interfering with religious freedom or to take steps preferring one religion or another. The rule appears to be clearly well established and the courts may maintain an attitude of strict impartiality between religions and should not disqualify any custody or to restrain any person from custody or visitation rights from taking the children to a particular church except where there is a clear and affirmative showing that the conflicting religious beliefs affect the general welfare of the child. We have no evidence of uh, such conflicting beliefs affecting Alex's welfare. A case which affects one of Jehovah's Two Witnesses. Two minutes. Thank you. A, ca a case that affected the, visita affected the visitation rights of one of Jehovah's Witnesses had a claim that sounds very similar to Mr. Dodd. 
Her claim was that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses confuse and alarm the children and that have been detrimental and confusing impact on their welfare and that the specific precept of non-observance of holidays caused a great deal of trauma for the children at school because they feel guilty. This uh, accusation was unsupported by any mental health expert. It was a surmise of the mother. It was an argument that was rejected. And the Munoz court found that the requirement, the factual requirement, was for a factual showing, not a mere conclusion or speculation. And again, repeated, in the absence of clear and affirmative showing that the re conflicting religious beliefs affect the general welfare of the children, the restriction cannot be upheld. And so our conclusion today and our prayer today is that we receive full custody of Alex Dodd, that his father be given liberal visitation so that he can have access and a, a reasonable opportunity to develop a good relationship with his parents. So you're asking for full custody or are you asking um, for shared sorry, parental shared, responsibility? Shared parental responsibility. With That's the wife providing the primary physical residence? Exactly. Okay. But I would like to conclude with a quotation from one final case. Do it in 30, 29 seconds. Okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, that case is Felton v. Felton, and it says, with regard to the attitude which I think will be best uh, serving both Alex's interests and protecting his, um, his ability to have a good relationship with both, both family groups. It says, the law tolerates and even encourages up to a point the child's exposure to the religious influences of both parents, although they are divided in their faiths. This, we think, is because the law sees a value in frequent and continuing contact of the child with both his parents and thus contact with the parents' separate religious preferences. There may also be a value in letting the children see, even at an early age, the religious models between which it is likely to lead them to choose in later life. And it is suggested sometime that a diversity of religious experience is itself a sound stimulant for the child. And this is referring to Smith v. Smith, a, uh, an Arizona case, but Felton is a Massachusetts case. And so that is our position that uh, the burden of proof has been adequately carried by Mrs. Dodd and without arrest. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we adjourn, let, let me make a, a few parting comments to the parties because <laughs> hopefully this will be the last time I see you two. That's assuming that subsequent today we have no modifications in the next uh, 16 years, or, uh, or actually I don't think I'm going to see this case anyway because I'm going down to Delray Beach. Um, number one, the two of you are indeed fortunate in that you do have a lovely son. Um, there are countless couples out there that try to have kids and, and don't. They, they fail in that. So you've been blessed in that respect. Unfortunately, you've, you have not been blessed in that your marriage just hasn't worked out for whatever the reason. And the law in this state just requires that I find that it's irretrievably broken. I'm sure I'm going to have no difficulty in doing that, and I don't have to you know, ascribe any, any particular blame to either party. Um, you've also been very fortunate with respect to this trial. You've, you've each had very, very capable counsel, and, and uh, this time I would just like to thank counsel for putting on a good trial. Uh, it's been quiet, orderly, and, and I appreciate that. A few words of what the next 16 years um, holds for each of you. Um, you're going to be living apart, you're, uh, and that's not going to change, but you still are going to have a son. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going to award shared parental responsibility. It's, it's just a matter of who I'm going to place the child with the majority of the time, but you're going to have shared parental responsibility. And that means that the two of you, for the next 16 years, will have the responsibility of jointly deciding what is best for your son. The two of you together will have to, you know, meet and, and talk about the major decisions. And that's not something that can come lightly. Now, one of you is going to be paying child support and one of you is going to be awarded visitation. Now, let me just say this, and, and I hate to put it in terms of a warning, but gosh, I'm going to do it. Um, I enforce my orders, and my order is going to contain a provision for visitation, and my order is going to contain a, visita a provision for support. And whichever one of you becomes the primary physical custodian, um, you are going to be expected to, to facilitate the visitation that I order. And if you don't, I'll tell you right now, no ifs, ands, or buts, you will go to jail. Because that's how I enforce my orders. That's the only way I can enforce my orders. And whether or not the other party is paying child support has nothing to do with the visitation. There is no connection with either one of them. So if you're supposed to allow the other party to have visitation and that party is not paying child support, 
you've got to come in here and tell me that you just can't refuse the visitation. Likewise, if you're the party paying child support and the other party is not permitting you visitation, tough. You still have to pay the child support. You have to bring to my attention the fact that you're not getting visitation. And whichever one of you is required to pay child support, if you don't do it, and I find that it is willful, and that you had the capability of doing it, I'm going to put you in jail. You know, and I know that sounds rough and it may sound crude and crass, but, you know, um, I'm just going to tell you the way I enforce the law. Because that's the only power that the court has. I hope it doesn't come to that, and I don't think it will. Because I think if each of you, I think each of you is, is, number one, each of you is certainly a loving, caring parent. Um, and you certainly don't want to harm or, or cause any grief to your child. Number two, I think each of you is a responsible individual. Um, so I just want to tell each of you, uh, you know, wish you each the best of luck, good fortune. And uh, does each of you, either of you have any questions for me at this time without asking me what I'm going to do? Okay, well, again, thank you very much, and I, uh, good luck to both of you.